Okay, well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another presentation of the online Cold Fusion Meetup. I'm Charlie Earhart, and I'll be your host for the next hour or so. Hopefully, yeah, you guys are commenting there that you can hear now. So in our meeting today, Thursday, October 24th at noon U.S. Eastern Time, our 253rd meeting, we have Pete Freitag speaking and presenting his uh, CF Summit talk, Approaches to More Secure Cold Fusion Code. And with that, take it away, and I'll get involved in the chat to see if people are still having audio problems. So, Pete, you go ahead and take it away. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, let me just go ahead and share my screen here. Okay. Okay, right. So as Charlie mentioned, I'm Pete Freitag. Uh, I have a company called Foundeo, which uh, works primarily in cold fusion and the CFML uh, landscape. Primarily, I do consulting work, which includes code reviews, server reviews, and development, uh, as well as three products, FuseGuard, which is a web app firewall for cold fusion, Hack My CF, which is a cold fusion server security scanner. So it's looking for issues like on your server setup and configuration. And then uh, the latest product is called Fixinator, which is a CSML code security scanner, which we'll, we'll look at that a little bit today uh, during this presentation. So you can also find me on my blog, pfrytag.com, on Twitter at pfrytag. I'm also pretty active in the CFML Slack channel. And so these slides are actually already posted on my blog, PeteFrytag.com. So if you want to grab them and, uh, for your purposes, uh, feel free to, to go there and, and get a copy. And so, yeah, my use of Cold Fusion is going back to the late 90s, uh, I think around like 98 or something like that. Uh, I started with Cold Fusion, so it's been, been quite a long road, but I still enjoy it. So, all right. So a couple of recent headlines uh, from, from the news. These are all this year. DoorDash, 4.9 million customer records breached. Facebook, 600 million passwords found stored in plain text. Uh, Dunkin' Donuts suffered a credential stuffing attack against their services. Um, in the first half of 2019, data breaches exposed 4.1 billion records um, of individuals. Uh, and then finally, a three-year-old boy repeatedly entered the wrong password and locked up his dad's iPad until the year 2067. These are all true stories and happened this year. So what, what can you take away from all this stuff that you constantly see stories like that in the news? Um, pretty much all of us have been impacted by a data breach in one way or another. Uh, even the biggest, wealthiest, and smartest companies are still struggling with this, and they still have security vulnerabilities. Um, so that kind of leads to the next point, which, which is that absolute or perfect security doesn't exist and probably never will. So that doesn't mean you should give up on security and not try. You still need to do your due diligence and, and do your best to make sure everything's secure. But um, this, this idea that everything can be perfectly secured is um, kind of a pipe dream. So it's also something we can't ignore because it ends up being very costly uh, when you have when you suffer security breaches, and I can attest that they're just not really that fun to deal with in general. So, um, most cold fusion developers I find are working with an old code base that's maybe 10 years old, 15 years old, 20 years old even, um, and it's very large. It's got a lot of code in it. So um, usually when I present this at a conference, I ask for a show of hands, and I would say three quarters at least will raise their hand saying that they have a large old code base. So these code bases typically have thousands of source code files. So maybe you might have like 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 CFM files. Um, it's probably got a lot of code you hope you don't ever have to see again in it as well. Um, Maybe that's in there. Uh, it can take weeks or months um, to go through and try and secure a code base like this, um, and maybe even years. So it can be very difficult to fix these types of code bases as well, because um, you'll find that they're a little bit brittle. So if you try and fix something, you find that six other things break. 
So, um, and of course, they're going to be using outdated techniques and technologies that maybe aren't commonly used anymore, maybe that was, were popular 12 years ago, that the developer that worked on it really liked a particular framework that, that nobody uses anymore, and now you've got to try and figure out how this old stuff works. So it can be, certainly it's a big challenge. Um, so a couple of different approaches I, I would take towards approaching such a code base. So you can go into crazy security mode and just spend several weeks dedicated to identifying, finding, and fixing the vulnerabilities within your application. Um, and that certainly works, but that, of course, requires you to not do any of your other work. And so I find in most cases that is a little bit unrealistic. Um, of an expectation that you'll be able to just spend like weeks and months working on nothing but security. Um, so I'd like to have a couple other approaches in my bag as well for that, those types of scenarios. So another thing you can do is do a prior, priority-based um, approach where you spend time identifying what the most critical vulnerabilities might be and start working on those types of areas within your application. And then the less critical ones, you can work on maybe as you see them, which, which brings to the third point here. So another way to work on this would be you don't maybe dedicate any specific time to working on security, but in your day-to-day -day work, you have a mindset of, as, if I see something that is a potential security issue, I need to go and fix that as I run into it in my day-to-day -day work. And so that can work, but the only problem with that type of approach is that you probably will miss parts of your code base that, that maybe you know, just work and they don't need a lot of maintenance, but could have security vulnerabilities in them. Um, so I think it's, it's probably a good idea to do some prioritization of, of the critical types of vulnerabilities. And we'll, we'll talk about what specifically types of things you can start looking for here as we go on. And finally, the fourth point is that you can hire somebody to go through and find issues or fix issues or prioritize issues in your code base for you um, if you're too busy to, to get started on any of this stuff. So step one, delete the code. So what do I mean by that? And I actually delete all the code, um, but you probably have a lot of code in your code base that never actually runs anymore. Maybe it's outdated and it doesn't need to be there. This old code often is going to be full of um, security issues because um, when we were writing code 15 to 20 years ago, we didn't know a lot of vulnerabilities um, <laughs> in general. So there was things like SQL injection was very well known going back like 20 years ago. Um, only like in the early 2000s did it start becoming you know, a prevalent thing that attackers were using. So, um, and then it took a number of years for developers to catch on to even start fixing it. So, there's, it's often going to be full of security holes. So if you've got old code that really doesn't need to be around anymore, you can get rid of it. All right, so the other thing you might have is stuff like this. Um, and this is, this is very common that I see this sort of thing a lot is that you'll have an index underscore two or index.old.csm or index backup, you know, dates, copies, a backup of an entire folder. So these patterns are not very hard to predict. So an attacker could just easily come up with or have a script that's going to go through and request things like this um, within your code and see if anything uh, is still responding. So, so these types of things need to go. So you might be a little bit worried about just deleting stuff like this. That's why you kind of made this home end version control. So the, the solution to that is really use a proper version control. So that should be like your first step if you're not already using version control. Um, get yourself onto some version control. And then you can start deleting stuff, and the version control will keep a backup of anything that you've deleted. Any change you've ever made to your code gets stored in the version control, and then it gives you the freedom to be able to just delete stuff, and then if you need to get it back, you can get it back, but um, you, can, you can feel confident about getting rid of stuff, deleting stuff, 
um, you know, you can just delete chunks of code instead of commenting them out. So it ends up keeping your code a whole lot cleaner and decreasing the size of your code is really going to help you to be able to maintain it and secure it. Um, it's also it's useful too if so you use the version control. Um, if, if you've got like a checked out copy of your code on the server, you can very easily see if um, anything's been tampered with uh, just by comparing the diff of, of what's in your on your server and uh, what it should be. So spend some time to identify if there's any parts of your application or code that, that you don't need and delete it. Um, so the version control will have your back if you deleted something you need it. Um, you, can, you can pull it back in. So there's a lot of fads that we see come up and as I'm sure a lot of you have been developing software for you know, 10 to 20 years, you've noticed things have come and gone uh, that, that have been popular. Um, things like SOAP web services are not really super popular anymore. There's a lot of things that were really popular at one time, but they go. But things like version control has been a, a staple of software development that's not going anywhere. So a couple ways you can identify some code that might be obsolete. Um, could be by, let's say you want to see what files haven't I touched in the past year. Um, here's some commands you could run on either Mac, Linux, or Windows to see which files haven't been modified in uh, over a year. Um, so if, you're on, if your server happens to be on, on Linux, you might actually be able to, to run this check to see the last time a file was actually accessed. So if you have like a CFM file that is somewhere, you know, that hasn't been accessed by the server file system in over a year, you could figure it out from that. Um, so there's, you can, you can pull that up in the slides. There's some a little caveats and things related to this particular trick, but it's, it's something to give it a try. All right, so the next thing we want to do, once we've kind of identified, you know, some of the old code, the unused code that we don't need anymore, and we can trim down our code base to only what's necessary, um, is to make sure that our server is fully patched. Um, and actually, this might be probably more important of a first step uh, to actually patch the server or make sure you're fully patched first. Um, because, so the reason for that is that um, when vulnerabilities come out in, the, in a cold fusion server patch, for example, it might be that the, the exploit could be something where it's possible to exploit it. An attacker can come up with an exploit and just actually hit all cold fusion servers or you know, attempt to hit as many cold fusion servers as it, with it as they can. So um, attackers pay attention to when vulnerabilities, when patches come out, and, and they try to reverse engineer what the actual issue is to see if they can exploit it. So you don't want to waste a whole lot of time when patches come out um, and when you actually apply them. So it's also important too that you are running on a version of Cold Fusion that um, still receives security patches. So that means you need to be using Cold Fusion 2016 or 2018 um, because CF11 is no longer getting security patches left security patch that came out did not include Cold Fusion 11 and um, pretty certain that it did have an issue that, was, that Cold Fusion 11 would be vulnerable to. So you want to make sure that you're always patching uh, your servers. So CF10, CF9, they've all been end of life for, for a while. Along with that, the operating system, make sure that that's being patched and up to date. Windows 2008, end of life in 2015. Uh, Windows 2012, I think, is good until 2023 or something like that. Um, so the other thing, Java is the version of Java you're running. Make sure that those are patched too because the version of Java can actually make a pretty significant difference in um, what types of issues you have. So here's a couple examples. 
So in like certain old versions of Java, there was uh, denial of service vulnerabilities in it. Like you could send a certain number to the server and cause it to crash. Um, there's the ability to do null byte injection in Java versions 1.7.40 and, and below, um, which can make a path traversal attack, which we'll talk about, even uh, more damaging. Things like CRLF injection has been fixed since CF10. Uh, file uploads, uh, somewhat more secure in CF10. And then again, this year there was another patch actually that, that made them uh, a little bit more secure as well by default. Um, you'll find as well with Java security patches, if, you ha if you're having issues with like CF HTTP connecting to an HTTPS server, that you're going to start running into all sorts of issues with SSL and TLS protocol implementations if you're still using an old version of Java. Um, so one of the tools my company makes, Hack My CF, can help you keep on top of this type of thing by letting you know, hey, the version of Java you're using has security vulnerabilities in it. You need to grab a new version. Or the version of ColdFusion you're running is the latest patched one. So it'll constantly um, check your server for that type of information. Uh, so making sure your server is locked down also has a really dramatic effect on um, the security of your application. So one of the most important ones is what user is your JVM or your Cold Fusion service running as? Is it running as, the, uh, as an admin user? If so, then it can do a lot more harm. Um, an attacker could do a lot more harm than if you had locked it down to use a dedicated user account with minimal permissions. Um, so it goes the same if you set up your Cold Fusion user such that it has the right permission to, you know, everywhere in the web group, or maybe it only has read-only access, um, then maybe potentially less harm could be done uh, if it only has read-only access to certain parts of the file system. So nearly 60% of breaches um, this particular survey found were due to an unpatched vulnerability. So it's, it's really important to keep on top of patches. Um, it really, really can make the difference between getting breached and not. So for example, one of the most well-known breaches in recent history is the Equifax breach. And that was caused by using a vulnerable Java library, Java Struts. So Struts was patched on March 7th of 2017, and they discovered the breach in July of 2017. And guess what day, so they discovered the breach July 29th, and they patched it, you know, a day later, obviously. Um, the speed of patching gets really quick once you discover you've been breached. Um, so it's better to, to do this stuff kind of regularly and stay on top of it and patch before you get breached rather than uh, after because it's much, much better to not have to deal with a breach at all. So, but I found this interesting as well. So a year later, after the Equifax breach, which um, used that vulnerable version of Apache Struts, um, 10,000 organizations had downloaded um, that known vulnerable version of Apache Struts. Um, of those 10,000 organizations included 57% of the Fortune Global 100. So that kind of tells us that we're not doing a good job paying attention of known vulnerabilities and maybe the tooling that we have to detect this sort of thing is not, you know, needs to be doing a good job as well. So you should have something in place where you can go through and check to see, you know, do I have known vulnerable libraries in my code? So the Fixnator product, which my company makes, is one tool you could use, which looks at CFML libraries for known vulnerabilities. So for example, um, like an FTK editor, if you remember back in like Cold Fusion 8 days, had that file upload vulnerability. Um, so it can detect all those those types of known vulnerabilities in CFML libraries. Um, 
It can also look for JavaScript libraries that have vulnerabilities as well as Java um, jar files with vulnerabilities. A couple uh, open source tools as well. There's OWASP dependency check, which will look at Java libraries as well as a couple other languages. There's retired.js, um, which is just looking at JavaScript libraries as well as uh, the npm audit command. If you're using npm for your JavaScript libraries, you can run that to get a list of what might be vulnerable. All right, so the problem we have though with, with tools like this is that it can be difficult to run them frequently because it's a lot of work to remember to, oh, I've got to run this tool and check my code. And you might say, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do this every month or I'm going to do this every quarter or I'm going to do it every week. But whatever you decide, you're probably not going to follow up on it. It's very, unless you have some sort of like, you know, compliance requirement or, you know, your boss is making sure you're doing it. So what we find is that something like continuous, this idea of continuous security um, makes the job for the developer a whole lot better by integrating this into a continuous integration pipeline. So you need version control for this, this idea of continuous security to work. So it doesn't matter what you use. There's GitHub, GitLab, uh, Bitbucket, uh, Azure DevOps has a, a version control as well. If you're not sure, like I don't know what to do, what should I pick? Um, GitLab has actually got a pretty cohesive solution and you could run that. Um, it, it also has an open source community edition that if you don't want to run their hosted version and you want to run in-house, you can run GitLab in-house as well. And then they have an enterprise edition with you can run in-house with uh, even more features. Um, so you've got to use yet another markup language, um, and that's actually what it's called. That's YAML. Uh, so all, in order to set this up, we need to use YAML, which shouldn't be too square, scary. It's just really, it looks like this, um, it, which, which may be new to you, but it's really not, not that difficult. Um, so beyond, and then what we need next is a CI platform, so a continuous integration platform. And so a lot of these version control tools now have this built in, so GitHub now has GitHub Actions. Um, Azure has Azure DevOps. Bitbucket has Bitbucket pipelines. And GitLab has GitLab pipelines. Um, there's also Jenkins, Circle CI, Travis CI. Um, I think that last one on the corner is AWS Code Build. So it doesn't it doesn't matter again which one you pick. Um, I would say that the Azure DevOps is good at connecting to any type of repository. So if you've got Maybe your own, even if you have, you're using Subversion instead of a Git for version control, um, Azure DevOps can connect to a Subversion repository and run a CI script. So this is how it works. So if you look all the way on the left, you've got that developer. They're working on their code. They commit the code. Um, the version control server invokes some sort of CI tool. The CI tool runs some sort of script. Which, is, which tells it what to do. That's how it does its, its integration work, right? And then, so that script that it runs could, could do any number of things. It can run tests. It can package up your code into zip files. It can build Docker containers. It can do any, anything you could imagine. Um, but when we're talking about continuous security, what we're going to have it do is run some security tools that will actually scan through the code and see if there's any issues in it. And then um, the nice thing about this is that feedback from the tool can be easily, and they call this shifting to the left, brought back to the developer, it, like almost instantly or maybe within a, a couple minutes after they've you know, pushed their commit. They're getting feedback saying, oh, there's a security vulnerability in this code. I need to go and address that. So you can very easily get that feedback and make the changes quickly. Um, and when you're, it's much easier to make a change like that. Like if you just introduce the security vulnerability in your code, it's much easier to fix it like the same day um, than it is to go back and remember what you were doing, get back into that context of, of your, um, of how the, all the requirements of what you were building and all that. It's much easier to do this with fresh in your mind.
So this is what the, uh, excuse me. Okay. This is what the uh, YAML script would look like. Um, and so the actual YAML script is going to be different depending on which CI platform you, you pick. Um, so this one actually I think is for Bitbucket pipeline. But essentially what we're doing is we're just telling it to, um, when, this, when this script runs, it already has a copy of your code in, in the directory that it's running in from the version controls. And it, you're just basically telling it, all right, run this tool against the code. And that's essentially all it is, just a couple lines of code. And then, so for example, in GitLab, this is what the result might look like here, where I've actually got a, um, in GitLab, it's nice, some of the CI platforms have um, very nice views that you can use that will show you the actual issues. So let me pull this up here. Actually, I've got it right here. Yeah, so you can see the, uh, it's telling me here, SQL injection found on um, line three of news.cfm. And we can see exactly what it is, and Fixinator is also even telling it what the solution, what one possible solution might be. We replace URL.id with CF query program. And you can, you know, create an issue from here and do all sorts of things with that. Okay, so we talked about this term of shifting left enables the developer to fix issues during development. Um, let me let me show you a quick example here as well of so I've got some code, real simple example here. I'm gonna scan it real quick with Fixinator. And so I'm just right now I'm running this inside command box and I'm not going into all the details of how to set up Fixinator, but I've already got it installed here and I'm just gonna run through it here. And you'll see it finds two vulnerabilities here. I found an SQL injection vulnerability and it found a, a vulnerable CFML library. So I've got a vulnerable version of SDK editor. So I'm gonna fix that one just by deleting it because I don't need that one. Uh, that's kind of my quick fix for that one. So now for this SQL injection vulnerability, which is right here, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have Fixinator actually fix this for me. And so if you watch up here, it's actually gonna go ahead and make the fix for me. And it just fixed the file, my editor just reloaded it. You can see it added that, the query param with the fix. So, so now at this point, I should have this code base all fixed. And what I'm going to do is actually fixing, fixing vulnerabilities. I'm going to commit this, and I'm going to push this code. So this particular one uh, is actually connected to Azure DevOps pipeline. You can see here, these were the two issues that it found. Um, and it's telling me here that it found this particular issue, um, you know, two minutes ago, and this other issue, that's SQL injection, has been there since October second, and it tells me actually the build that it, I added it in uh, as well. So, but now since I just committed that change to GitHub, um, remember I just said I was fixing vulnerabilities. It's actually running a scan against it right now, and so we'll come back to this in a minute, and it will show us. The, the result of that. Okay, so if you want to learn more about getting started with continuous integration, uh, Michael Bourne has a great five-day course. Um, it's, I mean, you could do it in a day if you're really dedicated. It doesn't have to be five days, but um, he kind of walks you through five different ways you can use CI with Cold Fusion, uh, and that's at learncf.teachable.com. Um, Fixinator also has a lot of guides um, in the documentation that will tell you how to set up CI on 
pretty much anything you, you could imagine. So GitLab, Bitbucket, Travis CI, Azure DevOps, AWS Cold Build, Circle CI, and Jenkins. So um, let's see here. So yeah, these are all the different guides. Like for example, for Azure DevOps, and it'll show you kind of exactly what you need to do. Essentially, you're really just going to put in that YAML file, and it, the software will kind of take it from there and run the file for you. Okay, so some other things you can do that are that are kind of high level things that can potentially um, do have a high impact is to implement a web application firewall. So what these do is they inspect the HTTP request um, or the response, and they block or log malicious requests. So this provides like a layer of defense in depth, and there's there's several options for this. There's a hardware based options, there's software based options um, uh, at the application level, so FuseGuard, the product my company makes, is one example of that. Um, there's a lot of choices. Uh, that one in particular is written in Cold Fusion. So, how do you start getting your hands dirty with the actual code? So, from there, we want to start by identifying, you know, some of the high-risk vulnerabilities. Um, it makes the most sense to really focus on those first, instead of getting carried away with like things that aren't going to have a large impact on security. Um, so you want to, like, I like to think about it as, like, what types of things um, are going to compromise the server directly uh, versus maybe they're just going to compromise a, a user. So they're both important, but um, I like to start with things like this, like the file uploads, remote code execution, SQL injection, file system access, maybe if you're accessing, creating processes dynamically with things like CF execute. So it's those things that can fully compromise the server. Things like cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, session hijacking, um, even like the uh, like TLS, SSL configuration tweaks and things like that. Those are really more like potentially going to compromise the user, not necessarily um, going to compromise the server the integrity of your server itself. So I like to start with the ones that are going to be more damaging. So for example, uh, remote code execution. So the evaluate function, um, when variables are passed into it, it will dynamically evaluate them. So in this particular code example, let's say you're writing, you know, like a conference schedule application and the a uh, person passes in URL.day and you want to write like Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday for, for day one, two, and three. So maybe this is the way you, you might have implemented that. It's a little bit wacky, but it's just kind of trying to be a simple example of how someone might use Evaluate. And, and so Evaluate was used quite a bit if you look back at a code that's written like 15 or more years ago. Um, and so the reason for that is um, it wasn't until I think it was Cold Fusion 4.5 or maybe 5 that things like the form scope were actually in a structure and they were accessible via structure functions. So prior to that, like one common use case I see a lot actually is with checkboxes, like dynamic checkboxes, and you're looping through uh, and doing an evaluate with it um, to, to figure out the value of each of the checkbox dynamically. Um, so let's take a look at an example of evaluate here. Okay, so this is my um, bank of insecurity website, which is a banking website that is just made up. You can get the source code on GitHub, but it's got um, all sorts of security vulnerabilities built into it. So I use this for security training when I do like a full day training session. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to trigger the error handler. And the reason for that is in the error handler, I've got this right here, where I'm doing an evaluate call here, where I'm saying URL.key, and I'm putting the very value of that there. So 
the problem is, since that's dynamically evaluated, um, what I can do is something like this. So it's going to take whatever I pass in as a variable name and evaluate it. So if I pass in a variable name that has code in it, like I'm doing here, this is CFML code. I'm calling ID dot, which so this is essentially URL dot ID dot list append, and then I'm passing in the get tick count function. And so you can see the result here is that it's actually running get tick count. So I'm writing CFML code from my address bar at this point. So I could do something like you know get current template path. Um, I could even, and then from there I could do like file delete if I was wanted to, or I could do file read. I think you can see now is actually reading the CFML. So, because the evaluate function evaluates dynamically, we want to avoid um, using evaluate in our code. The solution to this is to use bracket notation. So instead of um, using evaluate, we can use the variable scope here, which contains these, this day one, two, and three variable, and then reference it reference the day as a string um, in that case. So using the same using the same stuff here, we can rewrite this here using bracket notations as URL and then key. So if we reload this, now it's no longer um, treating, it's no longer dynamically evaluating this. It's actually just um, getting the actual value, which is one. Here. All right, so what you want to do is search your code for the evaluate function. Um, of course, you can use tools like Fixinator. It can even fix some of these for you. Um, like what it did for the SQL injection. Um, but so for evaluate though, it's, it is pretty easy. You can just search your code for this evaluate function. Um, you also want to look for the precision evaluate function because it works in the same way. And you would just want to make sure that your um, any variables that you're passing in evaluate, evaluate if, if um, essentially what you want to do is rewrite it to not use evaluate. Um, so you can use bracket notation in almost all cases. Um, but if there's a case where you really can't rewrite it or you can't come up with a way to rewrite it, um, and I pretty much find that you almost always can rewrite it, um, you would just need to make sure you're really certain that whatever you're passing in is, is an actual, like, like in the case here, we could have validated that URL that day is an integer, and then it wouldn't have been vulnerable to the um, remote code execution. So, um, but I think the better way to fix it is just to get rid of the evaluate function altogether. It'll be more performant and not vulnerable. All right, so does anybody know of any other functions that cause remote code execution? Go ahead and type it in the chat. I'll, let, I'll watch it for a second here if anybody gets it. Please type in. Anybody know what else might cause a remote code execution? Okay, JSON F. Got it. So the IIF function is another one. So IIF stands for uh, inline if or and and the way this function works is that the first argument is some condition. And then the second and the third argument are evaluated dynamically. So the second argument gets evaluated if the condition is true. 
and the third argument gets evaluated dynamically if the condition is false. So um, let's look at an example of, of that. Let's see here. So on the contact form, let me show you the code behind this first. So right here we're using this inline if function here. So, to, so it's, when it's displaying all the contact forms uh, to the admin user, um, if the contact has a length, display it. Otherwise, display anonymous. So you notice here that we're even using this DE function, which um, stands for delay, um, delay evaluation or execution. Um, but it doesn't prevent execution. It just, let's say, remember it like this. It just delays it. It doesn't prevent it. All right, so if I send this, um, the contact form, and now I go on close. All right, so there's the one from today. Yeah, so we've got this here from today. Um, Mr. 157, so you can see it's actually evaluating that um, get to count that we passed into there. All right, so how do you fix this type of code? Uh, here what you can do is check the length or um, switch it to use the ternary operator. So in this case, I, I can say, um, the way the ternary operator works is you have a condition in parentheses and then a question mark and then the value is true, colon the value is false. So that's kind of how you'd rename it. Um, you might potentially be able to use the Elvis operator, which is CF11 and up. Uh, but the, the difference between the what the Elvis operator does is it checks to see if it's defined. So if your condition was checking to see if something's defined in the IIF function, then you might be able to use the Elvis operator. Okay, so another type of vulnerability we have here are file upload vulnerabilities. So these are very common uh, within, within code. It's very common to have code that accepts file uploads, um, but they are also very dangerous. So you want to take particular close attention to code that's doing uploads and make sure that it's done properly. So I kind of have three core rules that um, really help improve the security of a file upload. All right, the first one is never trust a mine. So what I mean by that is the mine type. So there's, depending on what version of Cold Fusion you're using, so this is where um, I had mentioned things kind of change in terms of security when you're, depending on what version of Cold Fusion you're using. So if you're running Cold Fusion older than CF10, um, there's something called the strict attribute that was added to CF file action equals upload. And that's turned on by default. And what that does is that instead of looking at the mind type that um, the browser sends to upload the file, it actually does a server side check. Um, so that's a little bit better, but it's still not, it's not a perfect check, so we don't want to totally rely on that either. So the first, first rule is really we don't want to rely on mime type checking for the security of our file upload. It's okay to do it, but you don't want it to be your only check. So, and just to show you kind of prior to CF10, what you could do to get around that is you know, assuming I'm just doing a CF HTTP call, you set, do a file upload and you just say your MIME type of the file is image slash PNG and you upload a CFM file, it would let it through. Um, 
Um, so I'm not going to go into the details of this demo here, uh, but that's essentially that would work if you had strict equals false or CF10 and above or, or lower. The second rule is that we always want to validate the file extension uh, against a white list or an allow list. And so that type of list means that you say, uh, these, are, these are the type of file extensions I say are okay to upload, and you, make a, you have a list of them. So you, if it's like an image upload, you might say, all right, I only am going to allow JPEG, PNG, and GIF. If any file is uploaded that doesn't have that file extension, it's not allowed. And so when you use that approach, it, it provides much better security than if you're trying to use the opposite approach, which is let's, let's make sure we don't allow CFMs to be uploaded. Um, because the problem there is there's probably some extensions that you're forgetting, like in most cases .cfml will also work on your server, or maybe .jsp runs. There's even a JWS extension that might work in some cases. Um, there's a CFC file extension that you got to make sure you're not uploaded as well. So um, it's difficult to maintain uh, the opposite approach as well. Once, let's say, somebody installs PHP on the server, now you have PHP file extensions to worry about being uploaded and executed. So um, it's difficult to maintain that sort of thing. So at CF10 and up, you can actually specify the file extension in the accept attribute. So instead of specifying a list of mine types, you can just specify a list of file extensions. And the third rule is that the upload destination must be outside of the web group. Um, and so the reason for that is, if you look at this code here, uh, Right, so let's say I change this code here and I've got, you know, I'm actually checking the file extension here. Um, and then I, I say, all right, sorry, that wasn't, if somebody tries to upload a CFM here, I go ahead and delete it and I say, sorry, invalid file extension, throw an exception. So the problem is, with this type of approach, my destination is still under the web root in this photos directory here. So what can happen is that there's a small window here, where between when the file gets written to disk and this line of code here where it actually gets deleted, there's a, you know, maybe a, a millisecond or two where it could be executed. And it's possible to actually execute the file before it gets deleted. So you always want to make sure that your destination is not in the web root. You want to put it in something like, I like to just use git temp directory. If it's outside of the web root by default, it's always defined. It doesn't matter if it's Windows or Linux. It'll, it'll just kind of work. Um, and then once you've made sure it's good, then you can, if you really need to store it under the web root, you could move it back under the web root after you validate it. And it's valid. All right, a couple other tips uh, for file uploads. So, like I said, the file content checks or the mime type checks are not um, to be relied on solely, but it is, can be something you do as an additional check. So you can use the file get mime type or the is image file or the is PDF file. Um, just be aware that, that it could be possible to get, that an attacker could get around those. Um, if it's your only check, you don't want to rely on it. Um, another approach would be to upload directly to a static content server. So, for example, AWS S3, you can create a, on this blog entry will show you how kind of the approach of how it works, but you can create a policy that allows somebody to upload to an S3 bucket, um, and it can be like a temporary policy. You can tell exactly what the file name will be of their uploaded file. Um, and it kind of can happen client side in JavaScript. And the server side part of it really just generates this policy that allows it to upload the file. Um, 
So the next point here, make sure that the directory serving uploaded files cannot serve dynamic content. So this is, um, can be a really effective uh, defense that you can add is on your web server. So let's say if you're using IIS, you go into request filtering, and let's say you've got this photos, um, like right here, you've got this photos directory that can allow um, uploaded files into it, and it should only allow JPEGs, PNGs, and GIFs. What you can do is go to request filtering, go to file extensions, and then specify that you want to allow JPEG, allow PNG, allow GIF, and then you go into, I believe it's the feature settings, edit feature settings, and there's a checkbox that says something like allow unlisted file extensions. And you uncheck that, and then it, it turns it into an accept list or a whitelist of just serving these types of files from the directory. And so if somebody were to upload a CFM file, even if your code was allowing it, um, the web server, I asked in this case, would be blocking it from requesting it. So you would have a little bit of um, a little bit of relief from that particular vulnerability in your code without actually even fixing it. Uh, so also here, there's a cure upload.cfc, which is really just it's a real simple CFC that tries to follow those rules we we just talked about. Um, it doesn't use the MIME type check by default. Um, it checks to make sure that the file extensions are matching, and it will always upload to a temp directory by default as well, and then move it, move it to the destination. Um, all right, so in Cold Fusion 2018 Update 3, or CF 2016 Update 10, or CF 11 Update 18, which I think this was released maybe like in February of 2019, somewhere around there, there is now a, a new setting, which is in the application CFC, as well as the Cold Fusion Administrator. And it's basically a list of, and this is kind of like a blacklist type implementation, but it it tries to block uploads of like CFM, JSP, uh, CFML, CFC, all those types of file extensions that might be um, executable. It has a pre-built list of them in there that it will block by default. And you can go ahead and actually add to that. So if you, if you have another type of file extension that's executable on your server, um, you can add that into the list and make sure that all those are blocked. So you definitely want to make sure that that's uh, been updated and looked at. It's just a kind of separated list. Um, so another cool thing you can do with this feature is you can set it to a star, and this will actually block all um, extensions, which essentially prevents file uploads from working. So if you have code that doesn't um, accept file uploads, you might as well set this uh, block TXT for file upload equals star in your application CFC. Um, and then it will prevent those from working at all. All right, let's take a quick look at path traversal attacks. So this is what some vulnerable code might look like in a path traversal attack. So essentially, we just have a CFA include here with some uh, file name, which is being included dynamically. Let's take a look at the example. So this is essentially pretty much similar to the slide we just had there. Um, and if we look here, all right, so we're, we're hitting page.cfm equals founder.html, and it's just doing a uh, CF include of HTML slash founder.html. So the problem with this is that we can do dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash 
Um, I think we've got a master. All right, so we just went into the config folder that's above the web root and read the master password.txt file, which has the value of bank of I. So we could also read, there's some log files in here. Um, right, so it's, it's logging all the requests made to the server. So this particular vulnerability is even worse than just reading files, though. It can actually allow for remote code execution because Let me make a request here. I'll give a user, user agent of CF dump. And I'll make a fetch here. All right, that's just showing the result of the request. Dumping of a user agent here. So, um, let's see. So it turns into remote code execution. So there's a way you can get around that. Um, um, let's see. Or there's, I'm sorry, there's a setting you can use that will improve that. So this dot compile ext for include setting. And what we can do is if we enable that setting, Code. Uh, and we just set it to CFM, which it might be if you're running secure profile, it might already be set to that. Um, and now it's just going to So the CF dump here, it doesn't get treated as code, it just gets treated as text. So, but what you really need to do as well, um, because it still has a path traversal, it just doesn't have that remote code execution now, um, is you still need to make sure that you strip out variables from path. Um, and so in this particular case, I would probably just wrap it with an if statement or something like that. Uh, or switch case or something. So finding file access issues is a little bit more complicated um, because there's a lot of different tags and functions that can potentially work with files. So there's CF file, CF document, CF include, CF module, CF spreadsheet, file read, file write, file open, etc. cetera. Um, so you just got to go through all those types of functions and, and look in your code and see wherever you have file paths, make sure that there's no variables in them. And if they are, are they trusted variable? Can it be manipulated? All right, so we just got a minute or two left here, but I, um, I, I definitely want to cover SQL injection really quick just because it is such a prevalent issue. Um, you definitely want to make sure that you address it. So this is what a vulnerable piece of code looks like. It's vulnerable because that URL uh, the ID value could contain more than just an integer. It could contain additional parts of the SQL statement. Um, so in this case, and if you look at the example on the bottom there, they're hitting news.cfm, ID equals zero, semicolon, delete from news. So to fix that, you want to switch to use something like CF query param, which will, instead of passing the URL.ID as part of the SQL statement, it passes it as a parameter to the statement. So it's kind of a separate, it's in a separate, um, uh, like if you think about it as when the when ColdFusion is talking to the database server, it's got two folders. One folder has the SQL with a placeholder for where your variables go, and the second folder has the variable values. So it passes, it's keeping those two separate and giving it to the database server like that as like two separate folders instead of all just one folder, and it can um, prevent SQL injection. So similarly, if you're using query execute, you want to make sure it's parameterized. This is how the example on the bottom shows how you would do that. Um, you want to look for your CF query, your query execute, or MXQ query. 
Um, Pixinator, the static code analyzer, and Cold Fusion Builder can also help you find these. Um, and these are definitely ones that you want to fix as you see them in your code. So once you've got that taken care of pretty well, there's additional vulnerabilities you can go through and look for once you've maybe some of your session ones, your cross-site scripting, authentication, authorization um, are, are definitely important to look at, um, et cetera. OWASP.org has a lot of information about web application vulnerabilities that you can, um, that you can use to, to find info here. All right, thank you. And I will open up for questions, or I guess I'll let Charlie do that. I'll stop sharing here. Yep, so I've switched it to the mode where we can focus on the chat. I'll say that I've been watching really carefully, and I don't think uh, there's any questions. Maybe the one from Adrian, I answered what I could, but he'd asked at uh, about uh, 11, it says 11.26 to me. I oh, don't know if it'll say 12.26 to you. But it says, can Fixinator pipe those results to a file for extremely large code bases? Oh, yeah. And I answered yes, because I showed where that was yeah. discussed. And then it said, can it scan only certain folders? And yeah. I pointed to where those are discussed. Uh, yep, totally. Cool. Um, yep. Yeah, so the Fixinator can report, it can generate a JSON file with all the results, or it can generate an HTML file or a PDF. Um, or an XML file. By the way, Pete, that I XML. offered a couple of links there uh, where that's where I found that stuff discussed, and it wasn't discussed at that level of detail. So you might want to make a note to look and see where would one find okay. that. Sure. Um, the one link I offered is from GitHub, and it, it just kind of talks about yeah, you know, one can look at the source code and figure yeah. it out. But you might want to go ahead and mention that. And there's a question about price, which I offered a link to the Fixinator app URL where that's discussed, but if you want to go ahead and answer Phil's question. Yep. So the pricing starts at $64 um, a month for a basic level for an enterprise. It's $256 a month. And the enterprise edition, you can run it fully on your own servers. Uh, for the lower price points, it, it does scanning. Part of it happens on, um, actually works on AWS Lambda. Um, and it, it scans on through the cloud, basically. So that's all I think explaining how does Fixinator work. But, um, but yeah, that's price points. Um, and I think Lance was asking where the Git repo is for the, the bank application. Let me get that for you, and I'll send it through the chat. And folks, if you haven't noticed, there's a uh, evals on the right, and please do fill them out. We have about 48 people, and about 24, 26 of them have filled out evals on the right. So please take a moment to do that. And are there any other questions outstanding for Pete? By the way, uh, a high number of people have said that they would like to see another presentation from Pete. So go ahead and share with you, share with us here what sort of topics you think would be interesting. I'm sure Pete's already got several in mind, but hearing from folks is always good. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that one.
It's funny nobody's responding. You can talk about whatever you want, Pete. That's certainly true. Okay. And I'll just wait another moment here or something on modernizing on the application. Now, by the way, I'll say that, you know, Pete might have one, something he wants to talk about about that. But there were a couple of talks of that sort at the recent CF Summit and CF Camp. And I'll be reaching out to those folks who presented there. Uh, I've already got a few lined up. And by the way, everybody, you'll be hearing probably later today that we've already got somebody for next week and somebody for the week after that. And I think someone for the week after that. So starting to get the planes lined up to land in the runway. Yeah, thank you, Charlie, for getting this getting going together. Again. Good, to, <laughs> good to have it. Yeah. And I have a thought for Sue, but do you want to say anything there, Pete? Um, yeah, I'll let Charlie actually take that because he does that sort of thing a lot. And um, if you, if you have sure, so I'll just there. say that for some people, it's no big, no big deal. It's like no, no problem. For others, it's a nightmare, and they never get it done, and they leave and move to Node. And you might think I'm joking, but it's actually true. And the sad thing is that that's not the way it needs to be, but that's what they'll use as an excuse to say, that's it, we're finally getting off of CF. So just to be clear, you can install CF 2018 alongside of whatever version you have, and you could run them both on the same machine if you wanted to, if you're careful, or you could set it up on another machine, of course, and then either have them both point to your same source code or copy it over. But insofar as, you know, should you expect code that you have running on CF7 to work on CF2018, the answer is, yeah, yeah, maybe. It might just work fine. And then for some things, it may not work at all. And because you're skipping so many versions, 8, 2018, 2016, 11, 10, 9, 8, in your case, every one of those introduced compatibility issues. I'll just say that on my website on carehart.org, C-A-R-E-H-A-R-T, carehart.org. If you go to the presentations, you'll see that I had a talk that I did as late as uh, I think last year, early year before, on what's new in CF uh, 2016, 11, and 10 that you may have missed. And in that, I mentioned for each of those versions what sort of compatibility issues people would hit. So it'll also give you insight into what was new, but it'll help you to see what sort of compatibility issues each version brought. And you're going to have to look at each of those because each version will have introduced some potential challenge. Um, should we have the info on those sessions already? Rocky, if you're asking about the sessions that I said are coming up in the future, the answer would be no. I have tended not to announce more than one at a time. I was tempted this time to do it since I had three, but I just decided to wait till after Pete's talk. I may today announce two or three sessions at once, yes, and hope people will figure it out. Um, do you want to take reasons to go to CF from another language, Pete? Uh, from C okay. I mean, I from what I've seen, it's you got if you are going from CF to another language, it's going to be a very significant amount of work to rewrite applications from scratch. Um, so it's I, I wouldn't do it unless you are being mandated to or something like that. <laughs> um, yeah, it's definitely not. It's not as it's always as fun as you think it might be, from my experience. Can you clarify what you were meaning specifically? Um, the reasons to go from CF to actually, another actually, he was saying the reverse language. Oh, from another language to CF. I didn't think you were saying okay. don't do that. Uh, if somebody had to, you know, had a reason. Sure, there may be, and someone might enjoy it. But you know, that's yeah. these are now we're starting to get into things that really go beyond, you know, Pete's security talk, and we don't want to turn this yeah. into, you know, like the Tyobi thing. And like Adrian said, don't worry about it. It's not worth. You know, there's a bunch of CF, there's a bunch of people in the IT world that think CF's dead, don't want to hear about it, and we'll never let it show up. And by the way, I think Tyobi is one of those ones where they do it based on how many people search for the language in Google, and that's a challenge with CF because people might search for CF or CFML or Cold Fusion or Cold Space Fusion. Yeah, it's just yeah, it's not not a, not a great measure, um, and that's we maybe maybe it's time to have another one of these. 
moan sessions, I'll say, uh, where we talk about you know, CF's not dead, and why some people think it is dead, why others think it's not dead, and everybody can get all their beefs and concerns and all the things they think Adobe should be doing or shouldn't be doing off their chest. Right, and then there's that, right? CF also means cloud foundry and um, cystic fibrosis. It's just it's a mess. Anyway, back to uh, some of the questions that were raised. Um, oh, do, do, do. And Sue, you said you're going to new Windows 2016 servers. You know, that's that helps when you move to a new platform. You kind of take away the cruft of the old platform. Again, we don't want to get down into the weeds in this talk right now, but I'll just say that that could actually be a good thing. It can make, make it a challenge. Sometimes people go from an old version of CF on an old Windows or an old you know, Linux to a new version of CF on a new Windows or new Linux, maybe with a new web server, a new version. It just They try to do too much at once, and that leads to heartburn. Uh, you know, I think Pete was getting to this point earlier. This is stuff I do all the time. I can help people who are facing that challenge. I could guide you in usually fixing most of the problems, and it might be literally done in a matter of hours with just a little bit of help for many people. I've seen it, I've done it, so it isn't the terrible, scary monster that it might seem to be. And Sue said they're being mandated to rewrite to .NET. Yeah, that'll take a long time. Every, every time everybody says we're moving off of CF to whatever, I hear from them a year or two later that, yeah, it never didn't really get off the ground, or it's taken forever, and everybody's frustrated, and people are leaving. It's frustrating. Yes, and Michael, who runs the CF camp, event is saying last week in Munich we saw that CFML is definitely not dead. And of course he's making the distinction CFML versus CF and Lucy and that's another whole subject. And somebody had asked that earlier, why CF and not Lucy? And this is not the right place to get into a debate over those two. And that's another talk we could have. Anything else for Pete? Nice to see Priyank from Adobe chiming in to address Sue's question. But again, let's not open the floodgates to a lot of discussion with Adobe about issues that people face when they move. Yes, sir, Pete, you are that. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. I see some typing going on, so we'll just wait another moment. Yeah. And so with that, it looks like maybe most of the comments are just thank yous and goodbyes. Yep, so thank you for everybody. Uh, yeah, again, Alberta, let's not open that hornet's nest here. That's not the right place to get into that discussion. Um, I will say that the people who raised that issue on the forums got clarification at CF Summit that they would not be forced to pay that high price that they were being told to. So I don't know if they ever got back to addressing that on that forum thread, but for those that are wondering, just look for the word SAS, Cold Fusion, and you'll find that discussion. And um, there was some good resolution to that, and Adobe is taking steps to not do the kind of thing that was done to that customer. So again, that could be worthy of its own session, but let's go. On your blog, no, no. If you just Google Cold Fusion SAS, you'll find it's a, an Adobe forum thread or an Adobe community portal discussion or an Adobe community, the new community at adobe.com. You'll find it. Yes, Cold Fusion Summit videos. Uh, well, the slides have been posted. I don't think the videos have yet been posted. You just watch, listen everybody, watch coldfusion.adobe.com. That's the Cold Fusion portal. Many people don't know it exists. One of the other reasons why people say things are dead because they don't know stuff's out there. So coldfusion.adobe.com. That is the Cold Fusion community portal. And Adobe and others, Pete, myself, many, many others, blog on there, share all kinds of knowledge with each other. You can ask questions there. It's a separate thing from the community forum that has long existed in that previous forums.adobe.com. Now that's community.adobe.com. And is info about, yeah, info about my session is available on my website and on the Adobe forum. And the slides for my one hour talk are there 
my day long is not available online. I may be offering that as a class. Wow, this has been quite a lot. Um, I'll just throw out real quick for those of you that may feel like this is your only chance to get questions answered. That's not true either. There's a Facebook Cold Fusion Programmers group. Look it up. Just go to Facebook.com and look for the Cold Fusion Programmers group. So if you're in Facebook, you got a huge community of people there. If you're into Slack, there's a CFML Slack. You can just Google that, find out how to join that, and you can get questions and answers and listen in all day to water cooler conversations going on about all kinds of stuff. Uh, there's a Twitter account for Cold Fusion. And again, there's these forums from Adobe at community.adobe.com. There's a Cold Fusion forum and the portal. So these are all many, many ways people can get their questions answered, bring up their beefs, have roundtables with others supporting your concern or contending against it. So you know, let's not think that this is the only place stuff like this can happen. Was there anything re uh, remaining for Pete? I don't think so. I think we've gotten down to the bottom of any comments. Cool. Okay, anything else from you, Pete, uh, before we go? Uh, no, I don't think so. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Always awesome. And I'll go ahead and stop the recording, and just in case anybody's waiting to ask something off the recording.